Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's episode is called 50 Eyewitness Drawings of UFOs. What I've done is taken a decade of sightings. These are mostly from military witnesses, not all, but a lot. And most of these cases, or a good portion of them, were reported to Project Blue Book. I wanted to do this episode because I think it provides some very interesting insights into the nature and origin of the UFO phenomena. These cases all have first-hand eyewitnesses drawings to them. And they show how truly uh, different many UFO sightings are with a wide variety of craft with different shapes and sizes behaving in many different ways. I think these cases also show how truly common and widespread UFO encounters are. And they also show how our government, particularly our U.S. government and military, has badly bungled their handling of the UFO phenomena and have done their best to lie and cover it up. Uh, these are just a small portion of the actual number of cases. I chose these ones, which are dated from 1947 to 1957, because each of them do have first-hand drawings by the witnesses themselves. And I think that's very interesting. And it's just fascinating to see the different types of craft that people see. And it's often been said, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think that's especially true when it comes to UFOs which are often very difficult, if not impossible, to describe. Many of these show your typical flying saucer. Some show cigar-shaped cigar craft or egg-shaped craft. Many different types of craft. It's really amazing how many different types there are. But some are also strikingly similar, although they occurred very different times and places. So that's why I wanted to do this episode for you today. And let's just get started. The first case I'd like to talk to you about today occurred on July 2nd, 1947 in Lewiston, Idaho. This was at the very beginning of the modern age of UFOs, really just days before the Roswell UFO crash. And this particular sighting was investigated by Dr. James McDonald, a very prominent and pioneering UFO investigator. And the main witness is a lady by the name of Mrs. Berg. She was outside her home in Lewiston, Idaho, out hanging clothes, and was carrying baskets of laundry outside. And uh, she had been up until that morning, very skeptical of all the news about flying saucers that was in the media. And she wondered why she hadn't seen one and had resolved to keep an eye on the sky in case she had the opportunity and stepping out into her backyard, she looked up and saw three objects. She called out her husband, and both of them watched these three objects, which were disc-shaped, as she said, like two hubcaps face to face, and they were in a vertical position. She had the impression they were spinning. Her husband disagreed, but these three discs moved along, maintaining a uniform distance at, they said, fairly high speed, but occasionally dipping up and down as if moving along the surface of a wave. So these objects moved eastward until they finally disappeared towards the southeast, and Mrs. Berg thought of running into the kitchen to get some uh, binoculars, or some dark sunglasses rather, which would enable her to see them against the sun, but at this point they disappeared and they estimate that they watched these objects for about three minutes. They were silvery in appearance and glinted in the sun, but as they were watching them, more witnesses did come outside, so it wasn't just the Bergs. The other witnesses included their daughter, who was in junior high, and a friend who was visiting. In addition, two of their neighbors, the Joe Lifts, heard them talking and came out to watch, and their other neighbor, uh, Mrs. Sargent came out, and all of these witnesses saw these objects until they quickly moved off into the distance. 
The next case I'd like to talk about occurred just about one month later. This was on August 13, 1947, also in Idaho. This was in Twin Falls, Idaho. And there were three witnesses, a farmer and his two young sons, aged 8 and 10. They were at a fishing camp, and it was about 1 p.m. when the farmer went to look for the two boys. He had sent them to the river to get some tape for his boat. And this is when he noticed an object about 300 feet away and about 75 feet above the ground. Uh, this was below the canyon walls, which were about 400 feet high. And he was really impressed by the way this object was moving. It was, as he said, hedge hopping or following the contour of the ground. It was sky blue in color, about 20 feet in diameter and 10 feet thick so not terribly large, and it had little pods on the side from which it appeared flames were shooting out. It made little noise except for a swishing sound, uh, but he did notice that the trees were highly agitated by the craft as it passed over, and it turns out his two sons also observed this object, uh, but it was only in view for just a few seconds before it moved off but long enough to leave a deep impression on them. And as you can see from the drawing, these look like your typical, uh, well, not your typical, but a very unusual shaped craft. The next case I'd like to talk about occurred the next year on July 24, 1948, over Montgomery, Alabama. And this case became very, very famous, and it's very well known in the media. This involves two pilots who saw a UFO from their airplane, and it nearly collided into them. That was their impression. The pilots' names are Clarence Childs and John Whitted, and it was 2.45 when it was Captain Childs who first saw what he called an unusual light dead ahead of him from his cockpit. And it appeared to be closing rapidly, and it was moving so fast it was leaving a glowing streak. So he turned to his crew member, John Whitted, and said, look, here comes a new army jet job. That was his first impression, that this was some sort of new experimental aircraft. But as this object began to speed directly at them, in a slight dive and growing rapidly, uh, he was suddenly hit with the overwhelming sensation that this object, this light, whatever it was, was about to collide into them head on. So he quickly took his DC-3 plane into a bank to the left, and at the same time he said this strange object turned to its left as if to avoid the airliner. And John Whitted looked out the right side of the windows as this object streaked by, he said it was no farther than a half mile off their wingtip, which is very close for aircraft, and maybe about 500 feet higher than their plane. And he said it looked like a 100-foot-long rocket ship, right out of a Buck Rogers comic strip. It had two rows of brightly lit windows, or ports of some kind, and the bottom of the craft glowed a strange bluish color, and they could also see that there was an exhaust plume on its tail, which was very brilliant and almost caused their um, night vision to go away. And they watched this thing disappear as it climbed up into a thunderhead. It was only in view for about five seconds. It took them a few moments to recover their composure. And Clarence Childs, the other crew member decided to go into the passenger cabin to see if anyone else had seen this thing. Only one had, a gentleman by the name of Clarence McKelvey, who was an editor from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he was one of the few passengers who were awake at that hour. And he told Clarence Whitted, or um, he, rather he told John Whitted, that he had seen only a, quote, strange eerie streak. He said it was cherry red in color, but he saw no major detail. 
So this was a very well verified case. The witnesses are pretty much unimpeachable with a lot of military flying experience. And as soon as they landed, they talked to reporters and the incident became front page news across the country the next day and is now considered a classic case. Just a few days later, on July 31st, 1948, there was an incredible sighting in Indianapolis, Indiana. This was in the morning at about 8.25 a.m. when an electrician by the name of Vernon Swigert and his wife were, he was standing by an open window in his home shaving when this object in the sky attracted his attention. He rushed to the kitchen to alert his wife and they both looked out the kitchen window and got a good look at this object, which they said had a smooth surface and was shaped, they said, like a symbol. They estimated that this object was about 20 feet in diameter and maybe about six to eight feet high in its center, its highest point, uh, but not much larger than being able to carry perhaps one person. Uh, according to Vernon, this object was flat white, not shiny, and this thing passed at a high speed on a level eastern course and shimmered in the sun as if it were spinning. He estimates it was about 2,000 feet in alti altitude. He heard no sound, there was no exhaust trail, and they were so impressed they reported it to the Air Force. At this point, Project Blue Book was not in operation, but it was called Project Grudge, and they were beginning to collect UFO reports. So they made the drawing you see here. And it was just three months later, on October 1st, 1948, when there was another incredible sighting over New Orleans, Louisiana. And what's interesting about this case is the witness described this object as looking very much like a giant ice cream cone. And he made a report to OSI agents of the 4th Army Branch Intelligence Office in New Orleans, Louisiana. And according to the report, and I quote, the witness stated that on the morning of October 1st, 1948, he was squirrel hunting on his property and he had gotten up very early in the morning. At this particular time, it was too dark to go into the woods hunting, but was light enough to see what time it was by his watch. And at 5.40 a.m., he was looking to the south at the sky and saw the aerial object which he described as follows. It looked like an ice cream cone, he said, traveling toward the east with the larger end in front. At the front, it looked as if it were white hot, like the mantles in a gasoline lantern, and towards the rear it got gradually darker red. There was no visible metal or other material and no projections of any kind, only fire, the object made absolutely no noise and left no trail of any kind. It was traveling in a straight line from east to west and did not gain or lose in altitude. He saw no visible means of proportion. He estimates it was about three quarters of a mile away and at an elevation of about 2,500 feet. And as he says, I watched this object for approximately 10 seconds before it was obscured by some trees. It appeared to be about the size of an average airliner and was traveling at approximately 300 miles per hour. The larger end of the cone appeared to be thicker than the average airliner is through the fuselage, but it was about the same length. The object displayed no lights other than it appeared to be encased in flame and it did not light up the area. The there was no visible means of support and no control surfaces that he noticed. So after investigating this, the Blue Book intelligence officers decided that this was a meteor, case number 174. Though the witness disagrees and believes that this was not a shooting star. The next case I'd like to talk about occurred just 14 days later on October 15, 1948 at Fukuoka, Japan. 
And this is a very interesting case in which two Air Force pilots basically interacted with this UFO in sort of a cat and mouse game. And I'd just like to quote one of the Air Force pilots first. And uh, as he says, and I quote, My radar observer and myself were flying a routine airborne alert mission approximately 50 miles out to sea northwest of Fukuoka, Japan. We made our first contact with airborne radar set with a target we assumed to be a P-51. We attempted a practice interception, but the target put on a tremendous burst of speed and dived so fast we were unable to stay with it. And at this point, the intercepting aircraft was traveling at approximately 300 miles per hour and descending at 3,500 feet per minute. This was a head-on interception. And when this target's target passed under us, we executed a chandelle back to our original at, uh, altitude of approximately 6,000 feet. Our second target was immediately picked up on the scope, and a stern interception was attempted, but the aircraft immediately outdistanced us. At this time, we were puzzled by the tremendous bursts of speed. The third target was spotted visually by myself. I had an excellent silhouette of the target thrown against a very reflective undercast by a full moon, and I realized at this time that it did not look like any type of aircraft I was familiar with. So I immediately contacted my ground control station and asked for information regarding any aircraft flying in the area. I informed them of what I had seen and was in contact with them from then on. The fourth target passed directly over my ship from stern to bow at a speed of roughly twice that of my aircraft of 200 miles per hour. I caught just a fleeting glance, just enough to know that he had passed me. And the fifth and sixth targets were attempted radar interceptions, but their high rate of speed put them immediately out of range. The only aircraft I can compare our targets to is the German ME-262, but it was not an ME-262 or similar jet. And his co-pilot, the other member of his crew, was Barton Halter, a second lieutenant. Uh, he was the fighter's radar operator, and he agreed that this was unusual. And as Barton Halter, Halter said, we dived in an attempt to follow. It passed beneath us and was gone. I was notified by my pilot that we were diving at a rate of 3,500 feet a minute at 300 miles per hour. I had intended to ask the pilot to peel off after it split, but it was gone too fast. The next or second interception was from the rear of the target, as was the first. However, the target added a burst of speed dead ahead and outdistanced us immediately. And on the third interception, my pilot called a visual at 60 degrees port side, and by this time I made the pickup. It was at 45 degrees port, 3,000 feet, and 5 degrees below. My pilot made a rapid starboard turn in an attempt to head off the target. And by the time we got a stern of it, it was off again in a burst of speed and disappeared between 9 and 10 miles. And on the fourth interception, the pilot called me, called to me that we had been passed from above, from the rear, by our target. I picked up the target as it went off my scope, from 5 to 10 miles dead ahead and slightly above. And on the fifth and sixth interceptions, the target appeared at 9 miles, doing approximately 200 miles per hour. Then with a burst of speed, the target pulled away to the outer limit of my set which is 10 miles for airborne targets. This took approximately 15 to 20 seconds, and in my opinion, we were shown a new type of aircraft by some agency unknown to us. So they were absolutely puzzled. They do not believe this to be any conventional aircraft, and they reported it to their superiors in the Air Force. 
The next case I'd like to talk about took place the next year, actually on January 1st, 1949, over Jackson, Mississippi. Now, what's interesting about this case is the commanding general at Wright Field Intelligence in Ohio displayed a strong interest in this case, and they conducted an investigation and took first-hand testimony from the pilot, the witness, who says, and I quote, My wife and I were flying from Gulfport to North Jackson Air Park, and we were approaching the airport. Our altitude was about 1,800 feet when I saw something go in front of us. I assumed it was another plane, since it was headed towards the municipal airport in Jackson and was on the eastern leg of the airways. I watched the object to try to recognize the type of plane, and after it passed, it made a turn of about 50 degrees and headed southwest. And as the object made its turn, it was then that I noticed the object didn't have wings. At that time, my wife saw the object and became excited. She is a private pilot and familiar with plane identification from the air. And when it crossed in front of us, I estimate the speed to be about 200 miles per hour and about 500 feet in front of us. So this is very close, much too close for this to be another airplane. And as the witness says, we tried to point out the object to the pilot, but he thought we were trying to show him something else. And as the object turned and went to the southwest with a sudden burst of speed, it was out of sight. In all, I saw the object 10 or 12 seconds. So they reported this to uh, the predecessor of Project Blue Book. This is case number 233 in the Air Force files. And their official evaluation of this report says, and I quote, There is nothing in this incident that can be said to have an astronomical origin which is, in other words, saying that this was actually some sort of structured craft of unknown origin. So a very interesting case. And it was that same month, on January 27, 1949, that there was another incredible sighting by an Air Force officer and his wife between Cortez and Braderton, Florida. This uh, Air Force officer had an engineering background and was actually assigned to the Air Material Command Intelligence Department. And for a half an hour on that night, January 27, these witnesses watched something very strange moving around the sky. And they described this as an object that was resembling a cucumber in shape, but had a double row of lights. Uh, they said it had the appearance of, quote, a row of lighted windows, but brighter. And as this thing moved off into the distance, it became smaller and looked very much like a ball of fire, and they could see what appeared to be sparks flying from it. They described this as sparks like from the burning log, but the thing is, these were appearing in a rhythmic pattern. At this point, it was pale red, and the Air Force's summary says that this was exceptionally bright at split-second intervals and that during the second sighting of this object, the sparks appeared more pronounced and were apparently pulsating at approximately one quarter second intervals. And as the witnesses watched, this object appeared to bounce up and down as it climbed rapidly and faded off into the distance until it was a tiny point and then was gone. So a very unusual object, to say the least. Just three months later, on April 28, 1949, there was an unusual sighting at Fort Bliss in Texas. And what's interesting about this case is the witnesses were all military officers, and they sighted what they described as a flat, shining object stationary in the sky. So... Being military officers, they reported this, and all seven witnesses submitted visual impressions, uh, drawings of these objects. And as you can see, these drawings are all very similar. 
So it's clear that they saw something. Uh, they did not think it was a weather balloon. However, when the Air Force investigated it, it turned out that the Skyhook program had just started in White Sands several days prior to this sighting. And uh, these are giant balloons, some 150 feet in diameter, to test the upper atmosphere. And the investigators concluded that this is probably what the witnesses saw, but they're not sure because there were a number of other sightings at that time involving objects that were moving in ways that is not explainable as a balloon. So there's some controversy or confusion about what these were. And now we move on to the next case, which occurred just one month later, on May 24th, 1949. This is at Rogue River, Oregon. And this involves a very unusual looking object, uh, but the witnesses are almost unimpeachable. There were five people in a group who saw this object in the air over Rogue River, and two of them were actually aeronautical engineers. And these engineers approached the security officer at Ames, who was a representative for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. So good witnesses. And they were eventually interviewed by Project Grudge investigators. All five witnesses were questioned, and all of them gave identical accounts. And one of the witnesses says, and I quote, while fishing with a party of friends about two and a half miles up the Rogue River at approximately 5 p.m. on May 24th, 1949, my attention was called to an object in the sky. The object was to the east of my location. With the naked eye, little but a glare and a silvery glint could be seen. But after watching it for approximately one minute and a half, I was handed a pair of eight power binoculars, and it was then possible to see that the object was roughly circular in shape and appeared to be 30 to 35 feet in diameter. It had somewhat the cross-sectional appearance of a pancake, being thicker in the center than at the edges, and a small triangular fin started approximately in the middle and grew gradually higher to the rear as the object traveled. When first sighted, the object was moving slowly, but as I watched it through the glasses, it picked up speed, and when it vanished from sight approximately 90 seconds later, it was traveling as fast or faster than a jet plane. As far as could be seen, it had no openings or protuberances of any kind other than the fin, and there was neither sight nor sound of any driving force. So again, a very unusual object. This next case occurred on November 30, the same year, 1949, over Lexington, Nebraska. And this was not only investigated by the OSI District Office of the U.S. Government, but was also investigated by investigators J. Allen Hynek, who was newly the astronomical consultant for Project Blue Book and later investigated by UFO researcher Jan Aldrich. So an official report was filed by the OSI agents and one of the main witnesses was Dean Wolf. He was a farmer, there were several witnesses, but Dean Wolf had special training. And according to the report by the OSI, and I quote, the men were threshing grain in an open field. Dean Wolf first noted the objects coming from the southwest and called his helper's attention to the airplanes. As objects came closer, it was noted that they were not of conventional airplane design, and Dean Wolf was a recent graduate of a two-year course of aeronautical designing, and he stated he first thought the objects were F-80 aircraft, but as the objects moved, he realized that the objects had performance of an F-80, but did not have the design. Dean Wolf executed a free hand drawing, seen here, of what he believed the object looked like. Dean Wolf said the objects appeared to be drifting towards them over a low line of hills, seemed to pick up speed, 
at which time two of the objects left a trail of sparks. As the objects approached them, the lead and number two objects crisscrossed positions, with the number three maintaining its position in the formation. The objects then executed a 90 degree turn away from Earth and climbed straight up, disappearing from view. A dazzling brightness was noted from the objects and was believed to be a reflection until it was realized that the sun was almost on the horizon and the objects were going away from the sun. So this was clearly not a conventional plane and researchers later learned that there were in fact other witnesses including Mr. and Mrs. Don Balheim of Lexington, Nebraska and their daughter Janet. They were at their home standing in the front yard and saw these two objects which they said were traveling very fast. They estimated it was at about a mile of altitude, 5,000 feet. And uh, they looked much bulkier than a conventional aircraft, they said. Maintained a straight and level flight until suddenly turning away from the earth and going straight up, like Dean Wolf and the other witnesses said. And they said that they noticed what appeared to be a trail of sparks. So they were not aware of the other witnesses. And this is a multi-witness case. And as you can see from these drawings, a very unusual object. All right, moving along. Now we move to March 15, 1950, when Dr. Craig Hunter was driving on the Hudson area on Highway 153 all right, and now we move to March 15, 1950. This case took place in Penfield, Pennsylvania. The main witness is Dr. Craig Hunter, who was driving along Highway 153. And as he drove up this mountain road in a sparsely populated area, a warning light went on his dash, and the car's... Uh, anemeter indicated that the battery was discharging. So he parked and got out to check under the hood to see if there was an electrical short. And as he's poking around, inspecting the wires leading from the battery, another truck with a farmer pulled up, a Mr. Jaeger, and he introduced himself and offered to help. And they're looking at the engine when both men heard this weird, odd hissing and whistling sound. And looking up, they saw what they described as a weird machine with a dirty aluminum grayish color. It coasted leisurely into view, soaring very low level, about 350 feet above the ground. They said there was no way this thing was a balloon. He estimates that this object was 100 feet or so in diameter and about 30 feet thick. So he turned to the, Mr. Jaeger and uh, told him to look, and Mr. Jaeger looked at the object, stared in disbelief for a few seconds, then gasped, my God, jumped into his truck and drove away at high speed, terrified. Dr. Hunter, however, stood his ground, though he did later tell investigators that he was quite frightened, but overcoming his fear as best as he could, he studied this strange object and noticed three concentric circles on the underside that appeared to show a slowly rotating inner ring. And he thought perhaps he was looking at a radically new type of military aircraft. But as it passed out of sight, he realized that this was probably one of those UFOs that people were talking about. And he felt it was his civic duty to contact authorities so he called the local newspaper, the St. Mary Daily Press, who was very much impressed by his story. And uh, after talking to the witness, they realized that this was probably a UFO and put his story out on the AP Newswire. And this caused a lot of publicity and Dr. Hunter's phone began to ring constantly. And he got many other calls from people, but the one that really gave him some comfort was other witnesses who were in the area at the same time, and 
Some of them were in a plane, and they saw what they described as a shiny disk in the air. And also there was a large group of people on the ground who also observed this object. So he was not the only witness by any means. Now, here's another really fascinating case, which also took place in 1950, just five days later, on March 20th. This took place in the city of Stuttgart, Arkansas. And this is a really good case because it involves pilots uh, who were actually flying at the time. It was Captain Jack Adams and his co-pilot G.W. Anderson who were flying uh, their plane. It's Flight 53 at 9.30 p.m. Their plane was at about 2,000 feet altitude on a southwesterly course over Arkansas when suddenly Captain Adams noticed a bright light in the dark sky. And as he says, and I quote, the light had an unusual bluish and brilliant glow flashing on and off far more rapidly than the normal blinking of civilian aircraft lights. So he nudged his co-pilot and said, my God, what's that? And uh, his co-pilot Anderson took a look at this object which is apparently coming straight at them with great speed. This was a very bright light, he said, flashing every three seconds. And uh, they thought that this light was actually on the top of a flat, round object. Because as they watched, it crossed right in front of their airliner at an altitude of about 1,000 feet higher than their plane. And as it did so, it tilted at an angle so that only its underside was visible. And at this point they could see 9 to 12 glowing ports on the underside. These ports gave off a soft purple fluorescent light. And as Captain Adams says, although the object was moving at terrific speed, the pattern was clear and constant. It did not change shape as it darted past. The night was dark but clear and visibility was perhaps 40 to 80 miles. We could see no portion of the object other than the lights. So they were convinced that this was not a meteor, but some sort of craft about 100 feet in diameter. And as Captain Adams says, we kept this object in sight for about 45 seconds until it disappeared from sight. And I would estimate that it was traveling between 500 to 600 miles miles per hour. They asked if any of the passengers confirmed the sighting and uh, Captain Adams said we didn't tell them because we didn't want to alarm them. But they did contact Little Rock Tower to report their position and added that a quote flying saucer had just zoomed past. Well researcher and news commentator Frank Edwards heard about this and managed to contact Captain Adams while he was still airborne. And uh, Frank Edwards recorded this conversation and played it back over the air on the Mutual Radio Network. And the broadcast was a huge sensation. Captains Adams and Anderson became instant celebrities. And by the, ti by the time they landed, representatives of the United Press were there in large crowds to question both of the pilots. Both pilots said that they were absolutely convinced that they had witnessed the flight of an actual mechanical device which they thought might be a secret American experimental aircraft. They were aware of the recent Air Force statements that dismissed UFO reports, but they declared that it would be hard to fool them with all their flying experience. As An Pilot Anderson said, we've heard and read a lot about flying saucers and we're as skeptical as anyone else. But when you see something with your own eyes, you have to believe it. We were flabbergasted. So upon landing, they were approached by Air Force investigators and they discussed the UFO sightings for a few minutes and the Air Force officers told them that they had probably just seen a meteor. And this shocked and angered the pilots. However, 
ultimately the Air Force records this case as unidentified. And in support of this case, besides the two pilots, uh, other pilots came forward with seeing apparently the same object in the sky. And these include Captain Paul W. Bennett and First Officer William T. Tuero, who saw what they described as a, quote, bright and strange object in the distance off of Greenwood, Mississippi. And the pilots said they didn't want their friends kidding us about flying saucers, but they did tell the press, and they said that the saucer remained in view long enough to call their stewardess, Patricia Hicks, and she pointed it out to several passengers. And as it turns out, one of their passengers was a captain. His name was Captain Tommy Bridges. So this sighting created a lot of attention and sparked interest nationwide. And in fact, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, the widow of the late president, even invited the two pilots to appear with her on television. And this caused a lot of commentary. So news commentators who were very popular, people like Walter Kiernan, Drew Pearson, and Fulton Lewis Jr. took time out to comment about this sighting. And in fact, another promin prominent gentleman, W.H. Shippen, did a piece about the Air Force and their attempts to hush up witnesses. So this was great vindication for Major Donald Kehoe, who had recently been denounced as a rumor monger, and now people were beginning to listen to Donald Kehoe, who is today considered a true pioneer and hero in the UFO field. All right, moving along to the next case, which occurred on May 29, 1950, over Washington, D.C. This was about 50 miles southwest of Washington, D.C., when an American Airlines pilot, Captain Willis T. Sperry, was cruising along at 8,000 feet in his DC-6 when his attention was diverted as uh, he was looking at a map and his co-pilot Bill Bates caught sight of a brilliant blue glow and thought a collision was imminent so he yelled, watch it, watch it. Captain Sperry quickly looks up, grabs the controls and jerks the airliner into an abrupt turn as this strange glow zoomed directly toward his plane. And as it approached, they could see that this was a brilliant bluish fluorescent light. And after returning to a straight course and gathering their wits, Captain Sperry and his co-pilot saw that this blue light now appeared to be motionless. It was about 25 times the magnitude of the brightest star in the sky but after a moment, this blue light started to move, passed right in front of the moon, which was full at the time. And Captain Sperry, uh, his crew members Gates, and the flight engineer Robert Arnholt all could see a silhouette. And for about 10 seconds, they watched as this object hovered motionless, motionless. And then they saw that it had a cigar-like shape as it moved forward. And as Captain Sperry says, and I quote, when the object first appeared coming toward us, I started to turn to the right. Then when it changed its course to parallel us, I started turning to the left so as to be able to follow its path. Even so, it went to the rear of the plane, circled around to the right far enough so that first officer Gates saw it on his side before reversing its direction and going out of sight. So he immediately radioed Washington Tower, but the controllers there said that they did not see anything. They did alert the press, and the next day reporters questioned Captain Sperry, and instead of being ridiculed by his fellow pilots, they actually approached him and insisted on having a serious discussion about what they called the flying saucer problem. And uh, in fact, one of the pilots said that he had seen something just 400 miles to the south on that same evening. Uh, this was a pilot by the name of Henry H. Myers, 
who was actually Franklin Roosevelt's personal pilot during World War II. And he described seeing an object which he thought at first was a shooting star. However, this object dropped down out of sight, fell a distance, and then moved horizontally. Uh, so he doesn't think it was a meteor, and neither do uh, Captain Sperry and uh, Mr. Gates. And in fact, a spokesman for the American Airlines reacted to Captain Sperry's description of this UFO's astounding s speed and expressed amazement, noting that this object being able to circle a 300 mile per hour airliner twice demanded an engine of incredible power. So a very good case, and it remains unexplained to this day. The next case I'd like to talk about took place on February 10th, 1951, over Argentia in Newfoundland. The main witness is Lieutenant Fred W. Kingdon, Jr. of the U.S. Navy, and on the day in question, while serving as second plane commander on flight, he says, quote, I was an eyewitness to an unusual sighting of an unidentified flying object. We were at 10,000 feet altitude, cruising on a true course of about 230 degrees. My attention was first called to the occurrence by Mr. Bethune, this is one of the crew, who asked me to look at an unusual light which was to my right. I then saw that there was a glowing light beneath a thin layer of stratoform clouds beneath us. This was to my right and down at an angle of about 45 degrees. The subject appeared to lie on the surface and was throwing a yellowish-orange glare through the cloud deck. It appeared to be very large, and I first thought that it could be a large ship completely illuminated. Mr. Bethune and I watched the object for several minutes in trying to determine its na nature. We then called our navigator, this is Lieutenant Coger, to the cockpit to scrutinize the object and render his opinion as to its nature. While further observing the object, I saw that it suddenly started ascending through the cloud layer and then it became quite bright. The object was very large and was circular with a glowing yellow-orange ring around its outer edge. The object appeared to be climbing and moving at tremendous speed, and it appeared to be on a more or less collision course with our aircraft. When it appeared that there was a possibility of collision, the object appeared to make a 180-degree turn and disappeared over the horizon at terrific speed. During the course of events, Lieutenant Jones had come to the cockpit and he made a turn in the direction of the object, but it went out of sight in a short period of time. The speed was tremendous and the size was at least 200 to 300 feet in diameter. The object was close enough to see and observe it clearly and my first view of it resembled a huge fiery orange disc on its, on its edge. As it went further away, the center became darker, but the edge threw off a fiery hue, and when it went over the horizon, it seemed to go from a vertical position with only the trailing edge showing in a half-moon effect. So when the plane landed in Argentia, the pilots were interrogated by Captain Paulson of Pepperell Air Force Base and Navy Commander Wiemeyer. And of the Navy men, he later, uh, one of the Navy men said of the questioning, the types of questions they asked us were like Henry Ford asking about the Model T. You got the feeling they were putting words in your mouth. It was obvious that there had been many sightings in the same area, and most of the observers did not let the cat out of the bag openly. When we arrived in the U.S., we had to make a full report to Navy intelligence. And I found out a few months later that Gander radar did track the object in excess of 1,800 miles per hour. So despite this, that this object was on radar, uh, they could see its size, 300 feet in diameter. It was clearly a solid object. 
the Air Force concluded that what these pilots had seen was northern lights. This is typical of how Project Blue Book is trying to lie and cover up these UFO events. It's absolutely ridiculous. Another very interesting case occurred on April 16, 1952 in Yuma, Arizona. The main witnesses in this case were Lieutenant Gerald Williams and his date, Sally Ann Diggs, who it turns out is the daughter of Colonel Edward R. Diggs, then the newly commanding officer of the Yuma Air Force Base. And uh, as Sally Ann Diggs says, and I quote, no detail could be forgotten from that night in April 1952. It was a calm night, hot as usual for Yuma, Arizona. My date, Lieutenant Gerald Williams, and I had gone to a drive-in movie. The first feature was approximately one half finished when I decided to get out of the car and an extremely bright light caught my eyes from an angle to the right side of the movie screen. The object which emitted the light was one of the most awe-inspiring sights I have ever seen. I stood looking, transfixed, for I have never seen anything like this. It was quite, quite large, appearing to be the size of a car. It was beautiful in a weird way. The shape was that of two gently sloping bowls, each with rims to the other, and bottoms circular and flat. It almost seemed to be a portion of the landscape, for it was not very high in the sky, and its form was completely illuminated by its own lighting system. The top portion rotated ever so slowly, and I would not have noticed any movement if what may have been scars, indentations, or some type of markings had not appeared and disappeared. It was possible the lower portion moved also, but I did not feel that it did. The center rim, or ring, housed the yellow and rose-red pastel lights which completely bathed the object in light. With all the car windows open and the volume of the car speakers on, it would be impossible to say for sure that there was no sound, but I do not believe that there was any. It merely sat there and the top moved slowly. So she called for her boyfriend to come outside and he also saw it and he said, I've never seen anything like that in my life. My God, it was huge. So they tried to alert some other people in the theater, but nobody saw it. And uh, they ended up going home and telling her father, again the commanding general of Yuma Air Force Base, and he uh, demanded that someone investigate and they sent over an officer who attempted to explain away their sighting as best as he could with the commanding general there. Uh, but this sighting was very well verified and in fact just a few days after that there was another sighting over the same drive-in theater. I did cover this in more detail in my book UFOs at the Drive-In and in a prior YouTube episode. But years following the incident, researcher Richard Hall, working for NICAP, confirmed this incident, actually writing to Colonel Edward R. Diggs, who confirmed the report, and had little to add other than it caused quite a stir among those present at the drive-in theater at that time. All right, moving along, I mean, there's so many cases. June 21st, 1952, this is over South Texas. Sergeant Howard Davis was on an Air Force training wing as a passenger in an aircraft passing over South Texas, again on June 21st, when he witnessed an extraordinary spot of light flashing downwards. He only got a brief glimpse of a brilliant object, but he guessed it was about three feet by three feet and was trailing a tail of sparks at least 15 feet long. So uh, the, they thought this could possibly be a meteor, but it's clear from the drawing that this was not a meteor. And Sergeant Davis himself was convinced that he had viewed an actual machine whose shape and you know, the glow around it, he believed, held vital clues as to its power and its origin. It's an unusual case for sure. 
And here's another case involving your typical ice cream cone shaped object. This occurred on July 13, 1952 over Dayton, Ohio. And as you can see from this drawing, it's very unusual. This drawing was made by Ray Ellis, who was then president of the Rubber Seal Products in Dayton, Ohio. And on July 13, he saw this thing, which he described as looking very much like an ice cream cone. It appeared overhead at about 12.25 a.m. And as he got a close look at it, he could make out a quote, hemi, a hemisphere of white light in front of it, an elliptical dark object in the center where the ice cream would meet the cone, and the rest of it a bright light. So this is one of several cases in which UFOs are described as looking like an ice cream cone. Investigators now believe that this is probably just an effect of people seeing a disc-shaped object enveloped by a sort of plasma field trailing behind it. Hard to say, but it's definitely a very interesting sighting. Moving along, 1952 was a huge year for UFOs. It was just one week later, on July 20th, 1952, at around midnight, when a farmer in Madison, Florida, was checking on some piles of tobacco stored in a shed on his property. And looking out the window, uh, he caught sight of two, quote, somethings suspended in space. He was so amazed by this sight, he yelled to a farmhand standing nearby, and they both ran out to the window, peeked out, and the farmhand said, Lord, Mr. Woodson, what is that? For the next four minutes, the two men stared at uh, these glowing oblong objects. They were very curious, and were not sure what these objects were going to do, because they were just sitting there. And finally, one of these objects, quote, switched on a light, and then it began to move horizontally. And Mr. Uh, Woodson, the farmer, was absolutely convinced he was watching something, quote, uncanny. And he watched as this object creeped forward, and it didn't go far before it went back towards its companion, stopped for an instant, and then shot straight up out of sight, uh, seconds later, the other object, which had been still the whole time, quickly zoomed upwards following the first object. So clearly unexplained. And it was just 11 days later, on July 31st, 1952, when there was another sighting, this time over Passaic, New Jersey. And this sighting got a lot of attention because the witnesses were able to take photographs. There were two gentlemen, one by the name of John H. Riley and his friend George J. Stock, and they saw this large gray disc about 30 feet in diameter with a large central dome hovering 200 feet off the ground. They were able to take seven pictures with a Kodak Duoflex camera, and they said this object was traveling southeast at a leisurely speed appearing to come to an almost complete stop. When it came very close to the men, as if posing, it hovered for a few minutes. The entire sighting lasted about seven minutes. And John Riley says, and I quote, it was so near it could have been hit with a rifle. It made no sound and appeared to tilt as though to observe the ground before speeding off to the southwest. Now, although the pictures were actually taken by George Stock, there was controversy that followed when John Riley took these pictures and brought them to the New Jersey Morning Call newspaper office. And uh, they contacted Major Herman at Wright Field because they were amazed at how phenomenally clear these objects were and were convinced they were genuine. And when John Riley was questioned about it. He insisted that they were genuine, even when he was threatened with arrest. But as it turns out, George Stock took the photos. They are now considered a classic, and 
So I'm not sure who provided the drawing here. I believe it was George Stock. Uh, there's some controversy about that, but as you can see, it's a very well verified case that most researchers to this day believe is genuine. All right, moving along. 1952, again, a very big year. It was just two weeks later, on August 15, 1952, when two men in White Cloud, Michigan, were on a small boat casting for black bass on Diamond Lake. This is, again, outside of the city of White Cloud. It was 9.15 p.m. when they saw something weird streaking overhead, and one of the fishermen, he was a pilot and familiar with jets and had attended aircraft recognition classes, and he knew instantly that this was not a plane and that he was looking at an actual UFO, and he yelled to his companion, Look! And as they watched, this thing came out of the northwest and disappeared to the south, and it was in view, they estimate, for only about five seconds, but it was very low, passing overhead at a mere 800 feet high and maybe about 1,000 feet away. They estimate its speed is about 700 miles per hour, so quite fast. And the pilots estimated that this object was about the same size as the fuselage of a large aircraft. And he was very much impressed by the fluorescent blue-green glow it, came, it gave off. So he did provide a drawing for Air Force investigators. And it turns out that there were 20 other people on the lake at that time, plus residents in the area, who also saw this object. So it's a very well-verified multi-witness encounter. Just a short time later, August 24th, 1952, and this time over Tucson, Arizona, at 5.40 p.m., there was an amazing event in which an object was seen hovering overhead and then was seen shifting position in this weird, wavering, dancing motion. And the witnesses watched this object as it flew towards the west, and they described it, and I quote, The lower one-third of the object appeared to be surrounded by a misty substance less brilliant than the object itself, and the lower extremity of the sphere protruded below this halo. So as you can see from the drawings, a pretty interesting object. Here's another case uh, which was investigated by Project Blue Book, and this took place in Turkey. This was on September 25th, 1952, and this is in the Blue Book files, uh, and it's quite brief because the f information on this was pretty much unreadable, but what was readable was a few things. That the appearance of this object was definitely saucer-like, and that the source of the report was three U.S. Air Force non-commissioned officers, so good witnesses, and they estimated that the speed of this object was 1,000 miles per hour, so very fast, and that it flew in a very erratic flight path, unable or not matchable to a conventional aircraft. So it's a brief report, but quite interesting, and they were able to provide drawings, so I did include it here in this list. Okay, one month later, October 22nd, 1952, there was a huge disc seen over Laurenburg Maxton Air Force Base in North Carolina. An air policeman by the name of Bernard DeMonte was walking to his guard post at around 10.10 p.m. when he heard an odd, dull, monotonous tone coming from above. It was a no noise he'd never heard before, and looking up, he saw a huge circular object, which he estimated was between 100 and 150 feet in diameter, and he said it was covered with colored, steady, glowing lights. He saw two red lights along the leading edge and some 8 to 12 green ones on the trailing edge, and he said this disc flew around the air, air base in a huge arc at very high speed, 
and it was gone out of sight before he could summon the corporal of the guard. And uh, so a statement was written up for Project Blue Book. Uh, he confirmed the unusual droning sound, and uh, the corporal of the guard said that he was actually lying awake in his bunk when he heard the drone. And like DeMonte, he could not associate it with any jet aircraft. And it was DeMonte who ran into the room and said that this object, whatever it was, was actually round. And the corporal of the guard ran outside, but whatever it was, it had already gone. But he did see it from a distance of about two miles as it moved off but at that point he could not see its shape. So this was a pretty interesting case and as you can see from this drawing what's very interesting is the very first pass this object made was straight down the main runway of the Lorenberg Maxton Air Force Base and uh, they believe that this was absolutely a classic flying saucer not only because of its shape but that they saw these lights in a circular pattern. The next case I want to talk about is quite brief. This occurred on December 22, 1952, the last one of the year, and this occurred in Banning, California. The main witness is an instrument technician who was driving his car at around 7.30 p.m., not far from an Air Force base, and stopped to watch as a saucer-shaped object darted upwards from left to right, then leveled off at a high rate of speed. He said it was glowing white, but what was very interesting, he watched this thing roll over, tumbling, at least three times, and each time he could see that one side of this object was bright red. And this object began to move upwards. He watched it for about 15 minutes until it finally rised up so high it appeared to be a star-like object and then moved higher, higher up until it disappeared. So obviously your classic flying saucer. Uh, the next case I'd like to talk about occurred just a few days later. This is on January 1st, 4th. 1953, and this occurred in O'Galley, Florida. The witness is anonymous. Uh, it's a lady, and she said that she sighted an object that resembled the Davis aircraft wing. She did not see any fuselage. This was quite low. She estimated it was about 500 feet or less in altitude and flew very fast, about 500 miles per hour. She saw this object only very briefly for two to three seconds as it approached from a north-northwest direction in a slight turn and departed to the south-southwest. But she heard no sound, and she actually was able to see it because the lights from the neon signs at the Westchester Motor Court actually illuminated the lower surface of this object and the witness says that she saw at least four and not more than ten blue lights on the lower surface as you can see on this drawing. So this was a very clear night. There was no wind and she says, the witness, that this object was within 250 to 350 feet of her. Very close as it passed overhead. This next case is very interesting because there was numerous witnesses, all of whom are very familiar with aircraft. This occurred just two days later, on January 6, 1953, at Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas. Wiley Moore was a towerman at Love Field, and he drew a sketch of what he saw. He said this object flew at about 2,000 feet for five minutes and finally moved straight upwards at hundreds of miles per hour. There was another witness, Linwood Martin, an amateur astronomer who viewed it through a telescope, and he said that it, quote, had swept back wings with a red glow towards the front. The wings were blue and the center white. It moved forward and backward and seemed to be going higher all the time. There was another witness, a Mr. Fetchenbach, who was an air traffic controller 
who viewed it through binoculars and said that this object seemed to hover east of the field before moving off. And in fact, as he watched it, a number of pilots gathered in the control tower and watched it. And they all agree that this object at one point was moving about 2,000 miles per hour and moved upward to an estimated, they think, 100,000 feet in altitude before disappearing into the distance. So clearly not a normal aircraft. We had nothing that could go uh, that high and then disappear up into outer space. Next case I'd like to talk about occurred that same year. On April 23, 1953, in Addison, New York, the main witness is a 29-year-old forest ranger, and he was in the habit of looking out of his window to check for forest fires, and looking out his window, he saw a glowing lens-shaped object darting across the sky. So he actually drew this object for Project Blue Book investigators, and he described it as lens-shaped. He said it was highly polished silver and so bright that it lit up the ground below it. It moved so quickly that it left what appeared to be a black line trailing behind it, and it quickly disappeared into the clouds to the west and was gone. This next case, the location is unknown, it's not reported, but it occurred on June 24th, 1953, and was reported to Project Blue Book by weather observer Richard A. Hall, who made a sworn statement, and he was actually watching a balloon through a theodolite. This is a telescope which is used to track objects, and observers can triangulate uh, an object and estimate its size and altitude. So he's watching this balloon through the theodolite when the balloon actually burst. And where this balloon was, he now saw a glowing red, somewhat triangular shaped object, which he said was at least eight feet wide. So quite small, but it was the movement that really impressed him. As he said, it was making, and I quote, slow circular movements such as a loop. And as you can see from this drawing, th these are movements that are absolutely unconventional. And according to Richard A. Hall, this object picked up speed and gained in altitude until again it looked like just a little dot in the sky and disappeared upwards. So what this was, I don't know, but it clearly wasn't a weather balloon. And uh, the witness, Richard A. Hall, absolutely does not believe that this is a balloon because he was tracking one through a theodolite when this balloon actually burst, and in its place was this object. So perhaps it was investigating the balloon. I don't know, but it's a very interesting case. Here's an equally interesting case, which occurred at Point Magoo in Southern California on December 16, 1953. This is, of course, a very active area in the Santa Catalina Channel. And the flight crew of a Navy Super Constellation WV-2 aircraft were doing a test flight and had just reached 20,000 feet when someone said, Look out! There's a flying saucer. And as one of the witnesses says, and I quote, I looked out the windshield towards where Roy was pointing and I saw some sort of an object at approximately the altitude we were flying. So they tried to overtake this object, but this object easily outdistanced them, and all the crew members made official statements testifying to this sighting, and the pilot himself, after landing, made a sketch, which he provided to investigators. And it turns out the next day, they discovered that there were numerous other witnesses in the area who saw it, some from the ground, and they were using actually binoculars. So this was a very well-verified multi-witness sighting. The next case I'd like to talk about occurred on November 6, 1954, one year later, in Newcastle, Delaware. And again, this involved 
two military witnesses, U.S. Army corporals by the names of James Schmau and Robert G. Hoffman. They were driving at 8.30 p.m. in the evening, and I will just quote James Schmau directly. As he says, um, first they saw these objects, and as Schmau says, I told Bob to pull over because the objects were definitely foreign to me. I rolled the window down and watched the objects cross the road slowly. The objects stopped and changed position. They were in a trail formation and changed side to side and continued this way until out of sight. Robert Hoffman also gave a statement, and as he says, and I quote, We first saw them coming from the left across the highway, and we couldn't decide what they were. We stopped and watched them from the car while they went on to fade out of sight. They appeared as a brilliant glow with a haze of light below center and blue lights on the perimeter. So they thought the sighting was over, but it wasn't, because moments later the objects reappeared and started circling behind them, then back in front, and then stopped and shot up super fast, actually sending down a beam of light which struck the ground. Both men could hear at this time a low drone or throb, and as Robert Hoffman says, I could almost feel vibrations in the ground. They were impressed enough where they submitted a report to Project Blue Book, who refused to label the case unidentified and called it possible aircraft. This again shows Blue Book re their reluctance to label anything unidentified, even though the, these two officers were trained and saw this object from very close up. This next case took place on December 6, 1954, actually over a period of two days. This was in Sheboygan, Michigan. The witness is anonymous. She was in her home when she saw a UFO, but it was the next evening when she saw this saucer-shaped object hovering about eight feet above a lake off Orchard Beach. She watched it for nearly 10 minutes, she says, as it darted back and forth, much faster than a jet. And she, at this point, could see that it had two tiers of square windows along its side. The subject was going so brightly it was hard to look at. As she watched it, it rose straight up and disappeared, and she reported it to Project Blue Book. All right. Next year, 1955, February 15, this is at Green City, Missouri. The witness is anonymous. He was traveling east on Highway 16, about four miles west of the town of Green City. It was a clear day. There was little wind. The sun was very bright. And he was approaching this flat stretch of road when he noticed through the driver's side window a large metallic disc was quite low, about 500 feet above the ground, and he estimates about one mile away. And looking at it, he saw that this was a disc about 100 feet in diameter, 12 feet in thickness, and had what appeared to be several windows or portholes. Uh, he watched it but did not stop to observe this object and lost sight of it as the road dipped. He proceeded to the town of Green City, and reported it to the editor of the local paper, uh, who did report it to the Air Force. An investigating team came over and interviewed the witness and uh, had him sketch the UFO. So they went to this area but found no evidence of this object. But as you can see from the drawing, it's quite unusual. The next case I'd like to talk about occurred on June 20th, 1955, just a short time later, and this was over Dallas, Texas. And the witness in this case was Captain Richard S. Berry of the U.S. Marine Corps, who actually did postgraduate work at Duke University and was very familiar with the latest aircraft. And he told Air Force investigators that what he saw was very strange. He was out with his neighbor, a Mr. Stewart,
when they saw a dull red object glowing in the sky. And as they watched, it started changing colors to white, yellow, and dropping in altitude. And then they watched this object hover and then move faster than any jet could across the sky. And it stopped and hovered again. So he was very much impressed. So Captain Barry ran inside to get the binoculars and observed this object through the binoculars and could now see that this was a round, flat object. At this point it was glowing red. He saw three lights alongside the edge. This object moved off and a few minutes later appeared again, this time showing only a line of lights. It left and returned a third time and this time he again saw the shape of the object and the line of lights as it darted away for good and he made a report for Project Blue Book and provided a description and a sketch of this object, which as you can see, is quite unusual. It was just one month later, on July 25, 1955, over Patterson, New Jersey, when 19-year-old Daniel Kay was sitting in a local park and he saw what he described as a peculiar object, gray metallic, shaped like a cylinder with a circular ring running horizontally around the center. And according to Daniel, this ring had a rotating light on it, and as he watched, it moved off to the west until it was just a dot in the sky. It remained there for about 10 minutes. He says that there were other witnesses in the park who also saw it, and he reported it to Project Blue Book and provided this sketch that you see here of this object. All right, more cases to share. This next one occurred on August 1st, 1955, over Willoughby, Ohio. The main witness is Mr. Sheneman, and he was driving up to his house when he saw this strange saucer-shaped object drop down. And it moved so fast, he thought at first it was a plane about to crash into his home. And his wife and children saw it, and they thought the same thing, but instead this object was not a plane. It stopped and hovered about 60 feet over their garage. And they could now see that this was a disk about 90 feet across. It had bright red and green lights. But they quickly switched off, at which point they could see a domed body with a long, flat dome in profile that had many tiny points of lights on it. And there was a sound it emitted which the witnesses compared to the hum of an electric fan. And as they watched, this ship quickly darted over to a nearby uh, clump of woods where it paused for another five minutes before drifting away at leisurely speed. So it was about a year later when Air Force Project Blue Book agents found out about this case, and uh, by this point it had already been investigated by other researchers, Donald Kehoe, and they knew about this case, and they wrote that in view of the fact that Mr. and Mrs. Sheneman repeated almost exactly the story submitted in the UFO case dossier, it appears that Mr. Sheneman is familiar with known types of aircraft and that he still seemed frightened almost a year after his sighting, the undersigned investigator was left with the impression that the witness is sincere and truthful and that he did see something unusual and unknown. All right, the next case, December 21st, 1955. This one occurred over Washburn, Maine. And the main witness is Roberta V. Jacobs, who s she says she saw this object which was shaped very much like a flying fried egg. Uh, she described it as a disc with a cupola, and she watched it as it descended out of the sky to a position just above the roof of a snow-covered barn. She was struck by the gold appearance of this object's surface, which she said was indescribably beautiful. Uh, she was actually getting ready to go to bed when the whole farmyard lit up, which caused her to look out the window and see this, quote, saucer-like craft. 
It was revolving at high speed and giving off a brilliant light. And at this point, she said strange sensations came over her. She felt nauseated and had the distinct impression that this object was occupied and that the occupants inside this object knew she was looking out the window and were able to read her mind. Shortly thereafter, this object streaked silently away and she felt that this object moved away when the thought crossed her mind to telephone for help. So it's a brief sighting but very close up of a classic disc. All right, moving along to the next year, May 6, 1956. This occurred over Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The main witness is a lieutenant, an engineer from Tinker Air Force Base. And he observed an object which he said was shaped very much like a soup bowl or a teacup. He said it was intensely bright, orange colored, and rimmed by little lights that were far too numerous to actually count. He said it was stationary in the sky when he first saw it, but then it quickly darted rapidly to the north in a strange zigzag motion. He could hear no sound, and he said this object was far brighter than any other object in the sky. He was able to use binoculars and said that this object was very sharply defined. He watched it for about 10 minutes from his house, and then as it started to move away, he actually jumped into his car and followed it. And he reported it to Blue Book officers, and later other witnesses were located. So again, this is a very strange case, which does not match any conventional aircraft, and shows those weird slight variations that we see in a lot of these cases. All right, June 27, 1956 over Jamestown, Ohio. A family of four was drawn outside of their home around 2.25 in the afternoon when they saw a craft rising from the trees near their home. They had the impression this object was actually landed. They did not see it on the ground, but it came up out of the trees and hovered at treetop level. It was quite close and was totally silent. They said it was round about the size of a small car with a canopy or a bulge on top. And as they watched, this craft moved very quickly in a steep climb upwards, then went vertically straight upwards and was gone in seconds. One of the children said it looked, quote, like a button. So I like this case because it's a solid object seen in daylight, very close up, and moved in a way that is absolutely not attributable to any known aircraft. Just two or three months later, on September 2nd, 1956, a night watchman from Dayton, Ohio, had a very interesting sighting. He was 19 years old and also a college student, and he reported his sighting to the Air Force. And I'd just like to quote him directly. As this witness says, and I quote, I first saw this green object while making my last round at 4.30 a.m. as night watchman at the Dayton Country Club. It seemed to be hovering above the ground, moving slowly towards the clubhouse where I was standing. I flashed my five-cell flashlight on the object when it was on the far end of the grounds, but nothing happened. Later I went out on the grounds to see what was happening. I heard or smelled nothing as the wind was blowing towards the object. It was moving towards the house at a very slow speed. It was about 15 to 20 feet wide and 8 to 10 feet thick and was in oval shape. This object came to 150 feet or less of me when I flashed my light at it again. It disappeared from sight in an instant without moving away. We have a dog in the stable just to the right of where I spotted this object that was howling something terrible. Normally this dog is well behaved and doesn't bark much. I might say, after this thing was as close to me as it was, I was very frightened. The object lit everything around it and was about five to six feet above the ground. So that's low. 
uh, very close and clearly unexplained. All right, just a few more cases. On September 15, 1956, a couple was driving in the early morning upon near Salem, Indiana, when they came upon a UFO. As the woman says, and I quote, At first I was too startled to speak at all. I stared unable to believe my eyes, thinking I must be mistaken. But no, there it was. So I stammered to my husband, Look out there, quick, do you see what I think I see? He took one look and brought the car to a stop. We sat there on the hilltop and stared. I said amazed, Why, it's a flying saucer, isn't it? And my husband, who was very conservative, answered, Well, it certainly appears to be something like that. So they watched this in absolute fascination. They described it as looking very much like a metallic yo-yo. They saw a line which ran around the perimeter of the object, out of which came wisps of smoke or vapor. This object undulated up and down in sort of a wavering motion. And several cars were passing by. They tried three times to stop other cars. Each car stopped, took a look at the object, and the drivers of the car sped away in fear. Uh, the couple themselves said that they felt no fear, but were just super interested to see that this object was so close. And they watched it for at least five minutes when it suddenly turned on its side in a vertical position and darted away at super high speed. So fast it almost appeared to vanish. This next case I'd like to talk about is very interesting and quite bizarre. This occurred in vin sur carami in France on April 14, 1957. It was 3 p.m. when two women, Mrs. Garcin and Mrs. Rami, were walking along Route D24 just to the east of vin sur carami And suddenly at about 100 meters from where they were standing, 300 feet, they saw this very strange metallic object which had landed on the ground. They described it as dull, metal in color, and cone-shaped with the nose of the apparatus, apparatus vertically pointed downwards. And this object seemed to be maneuvering to land, and at this point they heard a deafening noise. And this noise, it turned out, was actually being made by a metal traffic sign that was being you know, vibrated by, apparently, the presence of this object. It was about five meters away from this object and was oscillating and vibrating so violently that they feared it might actually come loose. And they screamed in fear and surprise, which actually alerted a third witness, a beekeeper who came running out in time to see this object take off. And as it did, it shook this sign again very violently. Uh, police were called. They found clear landing traces. Project Blue Book came in. And after investigating, without really any investigation, they called it a hoax. Uh, even though there were multiple witnesses and landing traces, J. Allen Hynek absolutely disagreed, as did other French investigators who believe that this case was 100% genuine. It's another example of our own government basically lying about UFOs and trying to cover them up. Here's another very interesting case which occurred on July 30th, 1957 in Galt, Canada. Uh, this involved a young teenager by the name of Jack Stevens who at 10.30 in the morning was walking with his dog in a rural area when he saw a star-like light in the sky. And as he watched, this light swooped down, at which point it revealed itself to be a metallic saucer. Uh, he estimates it was about 30 feet in diameter, chrome-colored, and had a row of glowing portholes or openings. He heard a low throbbing noise, he said this object glowed red and was surrounded by a bright orange aura. 
and this quite uh, frightened him, and he was rooted to the spot. At the same time, his dog began whining and barking and groveling, and he watched this thing for almost 45 minutes. Uh, it was some distance away, not far, a few hundred feet, and after 45 minutes or so, this object rose up and left, and he ran home and told his parents, who could see that he was quite emotional about it, and later they went to the site, and reportedly there were some very interesting marks in the ground. There appeared to be several three-toed footprints on the ground. So this case caused quite a sensation. It was published in newspapers and was never explained. The next case I'd like to talk about occurred exactly one month later over Odessa, Texas on August 30th, 1957. Five kids were out playing one afternoon and one of the children, a 12-year-old, noticed a strange object stationary in the sky almost directly overhead and the kids were amazed and curious because it was unlike anything they'd ever seen before. They became very excited and they dashed inside and demanded that the grown-ups immediately go outside to see this object. And at first the pleas of the youngsters were brushed aside with the remarks that the object was probably a weather balloon and not worth the trouble. So the children ran back outside. This object was still there. The 12-year-old discussed the object with his 13-year-old sister, and they thought it was unexplainable. Although they were young and didn't know that much, uh, they were absolutely impressed. The other kids were about age 7 and 10, and didn't really know enough to be good witnesses. But the 12-year-old said that this thing looked exactly like a flying saucer, even though they did not know what a flying saucer even looked like. But the girl never forgot that sighting and uh, never saw anything like it again. And it was many years later that she wrote to Dr. J. Allen Hynek and she wanted to share her encounter. So she told Dr. Hynek uh, of Project Blue Book at that time that there was only a slight haze in the air at that time. The object was quite close, it appeared to be metallic. It never moved while it was being observed, and it eventually blended back into the sky as the sun dipped below the horizon. So they watched it for quite some time, and the parents never came out and saw it. Just goes to show you should listen to your kids when they say there's a UFO hovering outside. The next case I'd like to talk about occurred on October 7, 1957, outside of Los Angeles, California. Uh, off the Angeles Crest Highway. This is a pretty remote area near the National Forest there. A man and a woman were driving when they saw a cylindrical shaped object which they estimate was about 3,000 feet high. And uh, they watched this object as it moved across the sky for about 10 minutes until it disappeared. And he says that, quote, we were in a state of shock at what we were seeing to keep in an accurate account. The size was close to a thousand feet, or maybe eight or nine hundred feet. The shape was cylindrical and came to a point at the bow. At the stem was the most curious of all, a glowing ball above the hull which appeared to have no connecting point, which you can see from the drawing that they provided. This ball of light pulsated about 60 times a minute, so once every second, and it was between light blue and white, they said. It went to white as it pulsed, but this object had port lights or windows. They weren't sure, but they were round and large, and as the witness says, I didn't count them, but I estimate 15 or more. And uh, they were very large, whatever they were, the subject was close enough that they heard what they thought was a slight humming noise, but they were very impressed because there was no flames, no engine that they could see, no wings, no visible people, and it was almost totally silent. All right, the next case I'd like to talk about, uh, just a few more. This one occurred on November 7, 1957, over Montville, Ohio. 
The main witness is Olden Moore. He was driving at night when he saw what he first thought was a shooting star until suddenly it split into two pieces. One piece went straight up and the other swooped down towards him, revealing itself to be a saucer. And he watched as this object came lower and lower, appearing to come right towards him. He stopped his car and watched this thing hover about 200 feet overhead. And then it came in for a landing in a field about 500 feet away. As Olden Moore says, and I quote, I stood by the car watching the thing for some 15 minutes before I started to walk towards it. So he left his car and walked about 300 feet towards it till he approached within 200 feet, close enough that he could see that this was, in fact, a metallic saucer. It was surrounded by this haze, or this sort of mist. He said it was bright. It looked like a mirror, like chrome. And it was standing on these tiny little legs. He was concerned. He decided it was too dangerous to approach any closer. But realizing how strange this was, he decided to quickly jump back into his car and drive the short distance home to get his wife so he could see it. But upon returning, the object was gone. They did report it to investigators who questioned people in the area and found out that there were electromagnetic disturbances. One lady at the time of this sighting in the area was trying to watch TV and she says every channel was completely distorted and she ended up turning off the TV in disgust and just uh, went to bed. So it's a really good case. I mean this thing actually came in for a landing. He saw it within 200 feet and uh, clearly not explainable. And the last case I'd like to talk about occurred on December 16, 1957 over Long Island, New York to a lady by the name of Mrs. Starr. She woke up late one evening when light flooded her bedroom and looking out her window, she was shocked to see a 30 foot long gray craft with portholes hovering five feet above the ground right outside her window. Outside of this object were two figures walking around. They were very strange looking with uniforms and helmets and weird heads. They seemed to be carrying trays. She watched a third figure come out of the object. She watched this for about five minutes, at which point the figures entered the object, which rose slowly upwards and darted away. No noise was heard at any point. So again, another very unusual case, as you can see from her drawings. So honestly, I could list hundreds upon hundreds of other cases, but you get the idea. Contact is very widespread. It's occurring all over the world. These cases are just from 1947 to 1957, a 10-year period. And as you see from all these drawings, there's quite a bit of variation of these objects. And yet at the same time, many of these descriptions are almost exactly the same. Uh, so this shows that the reports are widespread it's clear our own government is lying through their teeth about them. But I think the most important takeaway is that these are real. <laughs> UFOs are real. It's clear people are seeing solid structured objects that are not from here. All right, that's it. Some 50 cases involving eyewitness drawings of UFOs. And again, as you can see, there is a dazzling array of different types of craft being sighted, of different sizes and shapes and behavior and maneuverability and so forth being sighted all across the world. Again, this is just from 1947 to 1957 al alone, a very small representative sample of the actual number of cases, but enough to show that contact is truly widespread, much more common than people realize, happening all over the world, and of course, still happening to the present day. And I think these cases also show how our government has really mishandled the UFO phenomena. They had every opportunity to be truthful and transparent and forthcoming, and they have not been. So I really wanted 
to do this episode today to let people know exactly what is going on behind the scenes. Our government has known for 80 years that this is a real phenomena. And despite even today their unwillingness to call this extraterrestrial, I think they know full well exactly what's going on here. So that's why I want to do this episode for you today. I truly appreciate you watching, so thank you very much for that. And until next time, keep searching for answers, keep searching for the truth, and most importantly, keep having fun.